Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Critical Issues Forum online teachers workshop. Today, we are going to have a second part of the scientific aspect of nuclear weapons. And I am uh, happy to have uh, Dr. Ferenc Darunek Veresh again for this lecture. And uh, today is December 11th, and uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you might have watched the Nobel Peace Prize uh, award ceremony. And uh, yesterday, ICANN was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize uh, along with the uh, one of the Hibakusha, Ms. Setsuko Thurlow, and uh, she explained, she talked about, she shared her experience of the horrific experience of the atomic bombing. So in his lecture today, he's going to talk about the actual impact, the inhumane effect of the nuclear weapon. So for this year's topic, it is so important to understand that scientific impact, the human impact of the use of nuclear weapons. So I am very much looking forward to uh, this lecture and thank you very much for watching this video. So Ferenc, now I am going to give you the microphone. Thank you, Masako. Um, I was very, very touched by yesterday's um, Nobel uh, Peace Prize ceremony. I thought that the speech that uh, uh, Beatrice Finn and, um, and uh, Survivor uh, was just really inspiring and, you know, really, really amazing. And I actually featured some of, the, some of it in these, uh, in these presentations um, because it's so, so important to emphasize the points. So I'm going to be talking about nuclear weapon effects, um, what happens in a nuclear explosion, um, blast effects, the thermal effects, the radiation effects. Um, and then what we're going to talk about is uh, nuclear winter, and nuclear famine, and some of the um, important research that has um, recently been done since 2009, 2011, or also several recent reports um, showing what incredible environmental effect um, multiple nuclear explosions can have. And this also very much, I believe, um, drove um, the import drives the importance of this new um, important uh, nuclear weapons ban treaty. Um, so what happens in a nuclear explosion? Well, in a nutshell, I'm going to explain it in detail. Um, but whatever happens, you know, you see the popular picture of the uh, mushroom cloud, always keep in mind the incredible suffering um, that has happened. Nuclear explosion is not just a mushroom cloud. Um, we, we tend to see these pictures and not really think, we think enough about the awesome power that was there, that is there in these explosions and the dramatic effect that they can have. So these are just to kind of summarize what I'm going to be talking about, which is that there's these effects. The blast wave is the high pressure wind, which travels out at speeds higher than the speed of sound causing mass damage like very powerful hurricanes. There are thermal effects that are caused by x-rays that turn to infrared light that streams from the fireball and causes fires and, uh, and mass death. And there's radiation from particles that's emitted from the fireball. So these are kind of an immediate effect. This can cause mass uh, fatalities uh, near the fireball. And then you can have residual radioactivity due to fission products that decay long after the fireball has disappeared. Um, neutrons come from it and um, they interact with the soil and the rock and the rock itself and the soil becomes radioactive. This gets carried around in the uh, mushroom cloud and then this travels over very long distances. This causes death that can last for decades. So I'm going to start with something maybe a little lighter because we're talking about such a heavy topic. Again, I'm going to focus on the science, but it's really important not to lose fact of really what I'm talking about, which is the devastating effect of, of nuclear weapons. So I start with the story of the tortoise and the hare. There's really two expanding spheres when you get an explosion, a nuclear explosion that caused damage. So first there's the X-ray sphere, and this is basically X-rays are energetic light that can cause a lot of damage. Um, kind of a, 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 um, a ball that expands outward. And 
have and there's also a debris sphere or so this is all the materials that the nuclear bomb is made out uh, out of that expands outward so that's what you have here in this diagram immediately after the bomb so one uh, millionth of a second later um, it's tens of millions millions of degrees celsius degrees kelvin <laughs> degrees celsius at this stage are basically the same um, extremely hot uh, and, and the material as it's so hot starts to expand outward. All the yield is deposited in the bomb material, so all the bomb yield, all the energy is deposited in the bomb materials. You heat it to 10 million degrees Kelvin, and then all the heated objects, uh, when, when something gets so hot, it starts to emit radiation. And that tends to be 1 to 10 keV. Don't worry about what keV means, it's just uh, a, a, a type of uh, an energy of an X-ray. And these X-rays travel a couple of millimeters to a few meters, so it's, it's pretty small fireball at this stage. But that sphere of X-ray starts expanding outward. You have enormous pressure in this very small space because you're increasing the temperature extremely high, and then the energy, the, 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 because you're increasing the pressure, whatever there is inside of it has to go somewhere. So the debris sphere, so that's the other one, that's the sphere in red, starts to heat up and the pressure starts to build. The temperature increasing means that atoms are jiggling around faster and so it pushes itself outward. And then if you think about it, if the atoms are jiggling faster and faster, then each little atom carries around a kick and this collective kick that you get from all the atoms heating up and jiggling back and forth is the increase in pressure that you get. So the de debris ball will slowly expand compared to the X-ray sphere, which is expanding much faster. But at one point, the debris ball that you have will become supersonic uh, blast wave and will cause an immense amount of damage. So you have two separate spheres that are carrying energy as they travel outward. The X-rays travels much faster, but they lose energy as time evolves. And you say, wait, how can that be since they travel at the speed of light? In fact, what's happening is the X-rays fly out for a few millimeters or up to a meter, and then they get absorbed um, by, the, by the material itself, and then gets re-emitted at another uh, wavelength um, X-ray. And so this kind of slows down the progression of the, um, of the sphere. Now we're about 300,000 degrees Kelvin, so it's cooled down quite a bit. At one point, the debris sphere expands faster than the speed of sound in the air, and becomes an actual shock wave, which is the blast wave. This is the terrible, uh, this has, has done so much damage in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Over time then the X-ray sphere, which in this analogy is the hair, um, which travels fast and slows down and the debris shock wave, which in this analogy is a tortoise, starts to overtake it. The X-ray sphere, it's called the isothermal sphere, is extremely br bright but it's hidden behind the debris sphere. The debris sphere, the shock wave, starts to now expand faster. You can kind of see that there, further outward and moves rapidly past the isothermal sphere. So the isothermal sphere, the very bright sphere, is sitting inside now the debris sphere, um, as I say. So, the, so a fraction of a milliseconds later, the brightness is now about 1% of the total thermal energy of the bomb. This is the first pulse that's seen from the bomb. A split second later, the debris shockwave starts to slow down and stops glowing and becomes transparent to the much brighter isothermal sphere, which is hidden inside of it, which glows at 8,000 degrees Celsius. 100 milliseconds after detonation, when you start to see that, that, that ball that's sitting, sitting inside, 99% um, of the thermal energy is in the second pulse due to the incredible brightness of this isothermal sphere. Now the temperature has gone down to thousands of degrees Celsius, basically the temperature of the surface of the sun. The debris shock wave does not glow, but continues to travel outward. This is the shock wave or blast wave, um, which travels out spherically. The light from the isothermal sphere is now visible, but it is in infrared and that heats everything. Now the, 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 um, the fireball, will be thousands of times brighter than the sun and will cause flash blindness uh, many miles away. So you can think of these as two pulses that happen. The first pulse 
And you notice on this graph, it's not a linear scale. This is the kind of thermal power, and this is the time um, in a very short time after the, uh, it's 100 microseconds, a very, very short time after the uh, explosion, you get one first pulse, and then 100 milliseconds later, you get the second pulse. And this is actually used in verifying to prove that a nuclear test um, is, uh, is coming from a nuclear explosion. It's not a linear scale that I show here. It goes from 10 microseconds to 100 microseconds and so on, so on, and so on. It goes up by factors of 10. Um, but here you can see that that first pulse, this is linear in this, in, in kind of the inset here. The first pulse is very fast and then a much slower uh, decaying uh, second pulse of light. And then you get the formation of the mushroom cloud. And basically what's happening, depending on how low the explosion, uh, at what altitude the explosion occurred, it will draw in kind of winds, draw in the dust and, and rocks and dirt uh, from the ground and whatever debris there may be and draw it into the, into the mushroom cloud. That's how you get that. It's important to know that a mushroom cloud doesn't just happen in nuclear explosions. It can happen in other large explosions as well. And often people confuse that by thinking that an explosion that they're seeing is a nuclear explosion when, it, when it's not. And so what happens is this, this, um, uh, this fireball uh, with the mushroom cloud uh, uh, rises very, very fast at speeds like 200 to 200 uh, miles per hour. And you get the blast wave coming out and everything happening, causing a lot of damage. Now, in general, when you think about nuclear bomb explosion, um, the energy is partitioned in the following way. 35% of the energy um, is thermal energy radiation release. So this is the infrared that I talked about earlier and other, uh, other wavelengths of light. 50% is the energy from the blast wave. So this is the shock wave that we talked about. And 15% is uh, nuclear radiation, which we'll also discuss. The 100% there make up the total TNT yield of a bomb. So when you think about a bomb being, say, 20 kilotons TNT, it means that the bomb is equivalent to 20,000 tons um, of TNT explosives. So it's hard to wrap your head about this, around this um, 20,000 tons, and think that a one ton is 1,000 kilograms. So we're talking about 20 million kilograms, the equivalent of 20 million kilograms of TNT explosives incredible amount of uh, explosives and devastation caused by these, uh, these bombs. So let's talk about the effect of the blast wave. You can see here, this is an explosion that happened on the ground. Um, you can see the fireball expanding. And then what you can also see very slightly, and I emphasize it here, is the shock front, the shock wave moving outward. So that's the blast wave. So it's moving outward to a space area um, in the air that hasn't actually um, interacted with the expanding uh, fireball. So the air has to kind of get out of the way and that's how the shock front happens. You can kind of think of a bomb as dropping a stone in a quiet pond. The waves will travel out in concentric circles and disturb the water. Of course, here we're talking about three dimensionals, is it three dimensions, not two dimensions, but it's the same kind of uh, concept. Instead of it being concentric circles that keep on moving out, it's one continuous wave uh, more like a tsunami. And a shock wave that travels out and compresses the air pressure, uh, uh, and compresses the air, and this is the pressure which is actually measured in pounds per square inch or, or PSI. Now, so talking about the effects of the blast wave, um, depending on how close you are to the explosion, um, you'll get a certain magnitude of um, overpressure. It's called overpressure. Um, so if you're very close to where the explosion happened, you'll get an overpressure of 100 PSI. That will be equivalent to a maximum wind velocity of 1400 miles per hour. If you're further away, then you might get 10 PSI wind uh, um, overpressure, and that will be equivalent to wind of 300 miles per hour. So hurricane force uh, winds. The blast wave travels outward, pushes the air outward, and compresses it. And the compressing air creates a front which causes two main effects. One is the static overpressure, which increases the local pressure um, of the moving front. It's the kind of like a tire running over your hand. 
um, this kind of crushing force. And then there's the dynamic overpressure, which is what I just discussed, which, is the, which causes a very high speed wind. And this is what causes the shattering effect. The pressure as a function of distance, uh, as a function of distance from the explosion is related to the yield, meaning that if you have a very large explosion, the further you are from, from, the, uh, from where the explosion detonated, the less the effect it's going to be. And this kind of uh, makes a lot of sense. When one hardens a missile silo or something or a building, it means that you're hardening the building or adding more concrete, steel, and so on to make sure it can resist certain pressure um, if it is hit. So that a higher yield would be needed to destroy that, that target. So let's talk about the blast wave from air bursts. Now, in this case, we see a bomb is exploding here. There's not really a, uh, a, a, a mushroom cloud in this case. It's exploding at about you know, 500 meters or 800 meters um, above the ground. And so the explosion, uh, the, um, the blast wave moves out spherically and interacts with the ground and causes you know, terrible devastation with the ground. But there's another effect and that's called the max stem. And this is when the, um, the incident wave, so the wave that's coming out uh, reflects off the uh, ground and interacts with the incident wave. And what then happens is you get, a, you get um, a, almost a uh, doubling of the effect. So you get a larger effect, a larger pressure that you would get, which means that you're actually increasing the distance of destruction from the, from the point of detonation to be much longer than if you had exploded it right onto the ground. So this is a way that you can magnify um, the effect of an explosion. If you want to sit, want to hit a particular target, um, then what, uh, and this is horrible to talk about it like this, then the, the planners for that would explode the bomb, not on the ground, but would explode, the, explode it a certain uh, amount of hundred, hundreds of meters um, uh, in altitude from the ground. Okay, so this is a, a video that I want to show you. Masako? Yes. Um, so this is where I'm gonna show the video. Uh -huh. So I'm gonna stop this. And maybe the, the best thing is if you, if you, you want me to show the video now, so that's easier to just include it and then cut, up, uh, cut the part where I'm speaking now. Or do you wanna just add it, have two files? Should I just show the video now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me yes. get, I'm gonna get rid of this here. And let's find the video. Bum, 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 bum. So I will pause the recording. Just, uh, just one second. So, I'll just, so this video uh, demonstrates the incredible uh, power of this Mac stem. Um, you, can see, you can see how, how, it, how it happens. The shock wave traveling along the ground tore apart what we placed at a distance equivalent to 500 meters. The blast pressure grew extremely powerful there, and that's what added greatly to the damage. The horizontal blast pressure intensified around 500 meters from ground zero. We filmed that movement using a special device that can detect invisible flows of air. Here's how the blast expands from the center of explosion. When the blast wave strikes the Earth, it is reflected upward to form a second dome-shaped shock wave. Let's focus on the area where the two waves meet. One shock wave comes from above as it expands from the core of the explosion. The other is reflected off the ground. The two blast waves then merge, more than doubling their individual pressure, and continue expanding in a horizontal direction. The combined wave grows in height and strength as it moves along the ground. This 
This is the shockwave known as the Mach stem. We used a very small amount of explosives, but something much bigger like an atomic bomb or a huge amount of explosives or explosion would have generated the same kind of shockwave movement. The result of our experiment is in line with what happened in Nagasaki, where mock reflection occurred at a short distance from ground zero and caused severe damage farther away. So you can see in this video how the two waves, so it's the incident wave, the wave that's coming out, um, reflected from the ground and is interacted with the reflection. And if you think about one wave is re really a shock front, which is really a pressure wave. The two pressure waves combined producing a much more dramatic um, effect. Okay, so let's get back to the, um, to the, to the lecture. Masako, can you pause the, this part? Okay. Okay, so that was the demonstration of the max stem. Now, it's important to realize that the blast wave effect is very different for different um, yields um, uh, explosions, but not maybe in the way that you might expect. So if you think about the energy in a kiloton TNT, here I'm kind of representing that here is this very thin blue line for 10, for a 10 kiloton bomb. For one megaton bomb, that's a hundred times more. So it's more like this. It's like a hundred times more. So you'd expect that the effect of the blast wave would be at least a hundred times more. But in fact, it's not that way. And, and not in any way am I diminishing the importance and how, how horrible the effect of the blast wave would be from a one megaton bomb. But the distance that you have, for example, this is concrete building collapsing. For a 10 kiloton bomb, that distance would be, say, one kilometer, where you would have a, a concrete building collapse from a 10 kiloton bomb. For one megaton bomb, which is 100 times more, it's not 100 kilometers. So at 10 kilotons, it's one kilometer. And for one megaton, it's not 100 kilometer, even though it's 100 ten, times 10 more yield. In fact, it's only five kilometers that you would get that. So that's an important thing to realize is that the blast effect, as with other ex, uh, um, effects, are not linear. So let's look at this in, just this, in this case here. Here we have the uh, concrete buildings collapsing for a one megaton bomb at five kilometers. Wood frame buildings collapse at something like seven kilometers. What, uh, windows shatter at a distance as far as 22 kilometers away. So that means that if you had a one megaton explosion, then 22 kilometers away, you can expect that windows to shatter. And all this is associated with the particular pressure that you would feel. So the important thing that I want to emphasize is that blast wave damage effects are not linear. One megaton bomb is 100 times a 10 kiloton bomb. But the same damage that occurs at a, dis a certain distance away for a 10 kiloton bomb in terms of blast does not occur 100 times that distance for a one megaton bomb. It's actually only five times that distance. That's awful, but the effect is uh, much less. And that's important to realize in terms of in, in planning and so on. Now this is, it seems kind of unintuitive, but this is a way that I can explain this. Think of the effect of a 10 kiloton bomb is like a small ball of a certain radius. I mean, that's, that's the radius that it, um, for a particular effect that it would, would have. So it's a small little ball. Imagine stuffing 100 of those little balls inside a balloon. The balloon itself won't expand 100 times the radius. It'll expand in a much smaller way. And that's kind of the way, and that's the reason why the effect is not linear. Here you can see what happens in an explosion um, to a, a house. This is kind of a famous series of pictures where you can see what happens um, due to heating and the blast wave. So the first thing is you get a very bright light, a very rapid heating um, on, on this side of the house. 
then suddenly the house starts to uh, turn on, turn on fire, start to start heating the paint and so on, things start, the, the side of the house starts to burn. And then the blast wave arrives, which I said is like a, like a giant wind, which hits the, um, which hits the house. And this destroys the house very quickly. Destruction in less than three seconds. So that was the blast wave effect. Now let's talk about thermal radiation. Thermal radiation can cause serious burns and can cause serious fires. Now, we're focusing here on the science, but through all the science that I discuss, don't forget the unspeakable horror um, that there was. These are uh, paintings uh, done uh, by survivors um, describe the horror of the thermal effect and the blast wave effect. And this was testimony um, for the 2017 Nobel Pr Peace Prize. The ceremony was yesterday uh, by uh, Madame Tetsuko Thurlow. Um, this quote is chilling. Proces processions of ghostly figures shuffled by, grotesquely wounded people. They were bleeding, burnt, blackened, and swollen. Parts of their bodies were missing. Flesh and skin hung from their bones, some with their eyeballs hanging in their hands, some with their bellies burst open their intestines hanging out. The foul stench of burnt human flesh filled the air. Thus with one bomb, my beloved city was obliterated. Most of its citizens, residents were civilians who were incinerated, vaporized, carbonized, among them members of my own family and 351 of my schoolmates. So let's talk about why this effect is so brutal. What does it really mean? Well, once you have a bomb, you're creating an object on Earth which is hotter than the sun, but very close to where you are, thousands of times brighter and will burn everything. Remember the house that I showed um, earlier. The way you can kind of think about this is in terms of a magnifying lens. You may remember when you were younger, what you to, to play, you played with a magnifying glass to make paper burn. And basically what's happening is you're taking those light rays that are coming from the sun and you're focusing them on a very small place. And each one of these little light beams is a little bit of energy. And once you add enough energy, get to a point, it starts heating the paper and the paper will start to burn. So here, a magnifying lens concentrates light and paper starts to burn at seven cal per centimeter squared. And it's just a unit of energy. Now, in the case of thermal radiation, the effect is also not linear. Um, so if you had a 10 kiloton bomb, then the distance from the hypocenter where, did, where the detonation happened, it would be less than two kilometers where you would have very, very severe pain, uh, charred skin, extreme pain, uh, second degree burn, blisters, uh, severe pain would be a little bit more than two kilometers away and then red dark skin, moderate pain, first degree burns would be something like uh, three kilometers away. Now, just as in the earlier case, even though the bomb of a me one megaton bomb is a hundred times bigger, it doesn't mean that since here it's about two kilometers that you would have the same effect at 200 kilometers. In fact, third degree burns would then be felt at 11 kilometers and you can see the pro pro progression that way. Let's just be clear about that. One megaton bomb which is a small bomb from the point of view of, well, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's a large bomb, um, but we have certainly bigger bombs, or the United States has, and Russia have bigger bombs. A one megaton bomb will give a serious sunburn away from 20 kilometers away, a third degree burn um, at 11 kilometers. Now, if in the picture that I showed you before with the magnifying glass, if you then um, have a lot of these light particles that have a lot of energy and um, produce a lot of heat, um, newspaper will start to burn at four to 15 cal per centimeter squared, but dry wood will start to burn at four to eight, and coarse grass will start to burn at six to 11, meaning that if you, that the, um, the thermal energy from the bomb itself will start to burn grass itself. Deciduous leaves here is four to eight. So a 100 kiloton bomb can ignite grass at three miles. That's the incredible thermal energy that's in these bombs. 
Now, this can of course lead to massive fires. Um, in the case of Hiroshima, there were very big fires. The initial fires were started by the thermal radiation and these combined and formed what are called super fires. And the minimum thermal fluence required is about 10 cal per centimeter squared, as I discussed earlier, to have, the, have these kinds of fires kind of spontaneously start. The high velocity winds directed towards the center of the fires causes kind of a chimney effect. It kind of produces its own um, weather system. Firestorms developed in Hiroshima about 20 minutes after the explosion. This caused mass, mass death, as I showed you in some of the pictures. Uh, and, it, and there was also a lot of death caused by the heat uh, or also by uh, suffocation. So the poor people thought that they would be safe in shelters. Um, but since these uh, the fires themselves suck all the oxygen out of the air, the people might be safe in the shelters, um, but they will die because the oxygen will, will, will not be there. Now, um, if you're close to where the explosion happened, most of the fatalities will be due to the blast, just because you're very close to where the explosion happened. They will not be so much uh, for, well, there will be also maybe for radiation, but it's, it's mostly because you're, you're so close to, your, to the, um, where the detonation happened that the fatalities will do to, be due to blast. At 50%, at a certain distance away, so in this case here, um, and this was for Hiroshima, about 1.5 kilometers, 50% of the casualties were due to the blast and 50% were due to the burns. And further away, as you get further away, the effects like thermal energy will start to dominate the fatality rate. Now let's talk about the effect of radiation. Um, even though I wanna emphasize this every time I see these pictures, even though we talk about the science, um, don't forget the unspeakable here horror um, of what can happen. So once you have a fission bomb, you have what's called initial radiation. This is radiation that's released in, in within the first minute. Prompt gamma rays, so these are just very fast uh, light particles, like X-rays, very fast at X-ray or very high energy X-rays and neutrons. And these penetrate deep to the ground from the rising fireball. The fireball rises very fast, as I said, something like 200 miles per hour. Then you can have very short-lived fission product decay. So because you're, you're um, providing, the, you're making the energy um, through the fission process, um, each time you fission something, you produce uh, fission products, which may be radioactive and will decay and uh, will cause a lot of uh, damage. Now, the effect is going to be much less when you have an air burst in Hiroshima, uh, if, for example, as Hiroshima, than you would have with a ground detonation. And this is precisely because the, the uh, air burst is so high, like 500 meters high or something like this, then the uh, gamma rays and so on won't reach, uh, won't reach below. And this is the reason why it's now possible to, to uh, live in Hiroshima. All the radioactive fallout and materials actually traveled up higher and settled somewhere away from the city. Now, residual radiation is more about what, I'm, what I just discussed, which is um, uh, radioactive materials that, uh, that tend to be there for a very, very long time. So what can happen, for example, is you can have these fission products, which you know, not all will decay very quickly. Some will be very long lived. And the fallout cloud can travel very high in the atmosphere and can travel uh, quite far away. And actually the fallout patterns that you have for um, this radiation is very, very complicated and can only be predicted by computer modeling. Um, so for this, you'd have to know uh, very much about the weather pattern and all these kinds of things, what the winds are and these kinds of things. You can kind of see that here, what happens. Um, these are detonations at different, uh, at different altitudes and the fallout contaminants will travel, uh, um, you know, will, be, will go at different altitudes and at different altitudes, you also have different winds. 
And so the effect is going to be very different. So in some cases, if you get very high up in the atmosphere, then those particulates that you produce um, will only settle down in months and months to come. And so it will be very, very difficult to associate any cancers that you might have due to this effect um, because cancer um, is so common. Now, keep in mind the idea of energy being carried by particles. That's why I always emphasize. The more energy you have, the more damage you can do, and the more bullets, the more damage as a whole. And you have the different types of bullets. So you have alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays that I just discussed. And different isotopes that you have produced to this, to this fission process, the fission products are left behind, um, will produce different doses. Now, the types of damage that you can do from these gamma rays and so on, from these fission products and so on, to cells, are really occur in two types. One is called a deterministic effect, which is a short-term, very high dose uh, of ionizing radiation. Um, and that's called the uh, acute radiation syndrome. And the other one is stochastic. And this is over a long time increased risk to, risk to cancers. And so this will basically be random at whether you would, whether the cancer, you know, if you've been exposed to a certain low dosage of radiation, whether the cancer that you get will be due to radiation or we do something else, it's very hard to determine this. And there's no threshold that exists for this. So in the case of the deterministic effect, um, you get acute, acute radiation syndrome at, when you receive a certain dose. But with the stochastic effect, kind of random statistical uh, chance that you will, you will get cancer if you've been exposed to radiation, um, there's no threshold of dose that exists to that, to that, except we know that at low doses, what we would expect is that the effect would be less. And so the probability would less that you would get cancer due to uh, the effect of uh, uh, radiation. Now there's an increase in cancer risk and if ARS, so the acute radiation syndrome is untreated, uh, then you get a high dose which can lead to death. And this is kind of a reminder of the horror of what radiation can do. This is assassination of the former Russian spy, um, Alexander Litvinenko. You saw what he looked like before, and then only 22 days later, um, he, he passed away and looked very, very different. And here's a testimony um, also from uh, the speech yesterday given by Madame Tetsuko Tsurlo on accepting the Nobel Peace Prize. In the weeks, months, and years that followed, many thousands more would die, often in random and mysterious ways from the delayed effects of radiation. Still to this day, radiation is killing survivors. So to summarize, prompt gammas and neutrons will come from the fission process. Beta gammas and alphas will come from radioactive decay of the fission products or induced radioactivity. Particles are like bullets that can damage the body. A dose exceeding a certain number, this is just a, uh, a unit of uh, dose, uh, will lead to acute radiation syndrome. And even higher than that can actually lead to death. Particles exposed over the population causes an increased cancer risk, but it's a totally statistical thing. It's random, and so it's very hard to know whether you would cancer, would, uh, whether the cancer is due to radiation or perhaps some other cause. To summarize further, the effect of a nuclear explosion is a destructive blast wave, which is ident identified, intensified by the air burst, as I discussed the max stem scenario or case. Thermal energy, which can cause massive burns. Thermal energy, which can cause mass fires. Initial radiation bursts with neutrons and gammas, um, which, will, which will, would um, cause people to uh, be seriously injured. Uh, and residual radiation, which will last over a much longer time. And of course, on top of this, we'll have little medical um, response support because it will be a radioactive area, uh, an area where there's lots of radioactivity and uh, difficult to access that. Now the effect of nuclear weapons, I really just uh, scratched the surface. There's many other types of effectors. There's psychological effect, displaced people, evacuation, um, economics, area would be denied, 
fire, burn, blindness, many other different type of effects. And then the question you can ask is, will international organizations be able to, scope, to cope? A recent study by the Norwegian Radiation Protection Agency found that adequate countermeasures to a nuclear detonation simply doesn't exist, even given the vast resources Norway has at its disposal. No official UN organization mandate is to deal with such an event. No specific United Nations or interagency planning or exercises conducted to prepare for a nuclear detonation. Well, there have been, have been uh, well, there have been such studies for, uh, for radiological incidents such as a dirty bomb scenario. We really are unprepared for uh, a nuclear weapon uh, detonation. If only a small fraction of today's nuclear weapons were used, soot and smoke from the firestorms would loft high into the atmosphere, cooling, darkening, and drying the Earth's surface for more than a decade. It would obliterate food crops, putting billions at risk of starvation. Yet we continue to live in denial of this exis existential threat. So this was a quote from uh, Beatrice Finns. You see her in this uh, picture, uh, Nobel Prize uh, winning speech, um, describing this recent um, effect uh, research where um, we found that uh, nuclear weapons or when several nuclear weapons are detonated at once, it can lead to catastrophic climactic um, effects, which I will discuss now. So this is really the resurgence of the concept of nuclear winter. Massive amounts of smoke and soot from the fires rise in the upper atmosphere. Then sunlight is reflected back into space and you get very rapid large drops in global surface temperatures. And unfortunately this would, would um, be, lead to collapse of basic life-sustaining um, ecosystems. So this is work research that was done originally by Carl Sagan and, and company, um, but recently because of the uh, amazing technology that there is now with um, studies of climate change, this, these kind of uh, computer models were used to determine what would be the effect if there would be uh, something like 100 Hiroshima type weapons um, that would be uh, detonated, which I emphasize is only 0.03% of all the nuclear weapons um, that exist. So imagine a skirmish in Kashmir uh, escalating and due to poor communication, misunderstanding, panic and fear, perhaps this time we wouldn't be so lucky. Now, this case was the case of um, India and Pakistan. That's the scenario that they thought about. But you can now, with this recent tension in North Korea, um, expand that thinking towards misunderstanding, uh, miscommunication, um, something happened, happening in North Korea where some of these nuclear weapons would be detonated. The effects are devastating. In this case that I discussed here, the India and Pakistan case, at least 20 million deaths, but that is not all. Massive fires would be produced, which would be fueled by winds, which would produce um, five teragrams, a huge amount of smoke injected into the upper troposphere. These heated soot particles would loft into the upper atmosphere and would block and absorb sunlight. After 49 days, the particles would blanket the entire inhabited Earth, blocking enough sunlight that skies would look overcast almost everywhere. Can you imagine that? Almost everywhere, the sky would be overcast. Would be dramatic drop in temperature. You can see that this is the, uh, the temperature in time, so start in 1880, um, how the temperature has increased. And then if that would happen, you would have a dramatic, dramatic drop in temperature, uh, something like this, and would take a decade to come back to normal. So the resulting soot cloud would block seven to 10% of the sunlight leading to significant cooling and reductions in precipitation lasting for more than a decade. Growing seasons around the world is shortened, not allowing crops to reach maturity. This will lead to increase in price of food, food uh, mass starvation, hoarding by countries that have funds, would cause disease, war, competition for food. And according to the IPPNW, or a separate organization that studied this, there would be 2 billion people um, at risk um, of dying. That's not all. 
the heating of smoke particles high in the atmosphere um, increase the local temperature by at least 50 degrees Celsius high in the atmosphere. So this is at very high altitudes. This draws in nitrogen oxides, which actually causes the depletion of the ozone layer. And, um, and so it would also be uh, uh, ozone depleted. Would cause damage to terrestrial and oceanic plants and produce skin cancer, ocular damage, and other health effects in humans and animals. Now the ozone depletion is large and long lasting at all uh, latitudes, um, but it changes whether you're at high, altitude, high latitude or um, along the equator. The effect in any case would be very dramatic. The impact on agriculture would be sudden cooling, less sunlight, less rainfall, shortened growing season, reduced crop yields. Um, the Stratospheric ozone depletion damage would, would also damage the crops, which are very sensitive to UV, crops that are sensitive to UV. And disruption of petroleum supplies affects use of farm machinery and fertilizers and pesticides and so on. And radioactive and toxic contamination takes vital farmland, farmland out of production. You would have a collapse of the global distribution system. So the effect of a multiple nuclear weapons are catastrophic and dwarf that due to just global wars. And I say just global wars. We talked about 20 million people who would die in, a, in the case that I discussed between um, India and Pakistan. Effects are sudden cooling, UV depletion leads to massive global famine as the price of food increases, making them inaccessible to population already vulnerable to food pricing and a massive starvation um, on a global scale. Here are some references that I, that I referenced um, describing the effects. This nuclear darkness page here um, describes this last part about the climate change. Um, and so you can see also some, some uh, diagrams there and kind of interactive so you can see really um, what, is, what would happen. Okay, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ferenc. It was uh, quite scary, <laughs> but a very important lecture. So uh, I have a, um, for those who are watching the um, video, I just wanted to ask just a couple of questions. I may, could you uh, explain one more time the, the residu residual radiation part? Because many people often ask, uh, how long Hiroshima, at, when atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima, many people thought no one can live there uh, for many, many years. But um, people started, um, you know, coming back. And uh, and I heard actually this a uh, few weeks ago when I went to Hiroshima, I, I again, I visited the museum and I asked to uh, know who uh, the uh, museum uh, director and uh, he said uh, people who came back to Hiroshima within uh, two weeks of the detonation were officially recognized as a like a basically atomic bombing survivor. Yeah. So I'm always a little bit confused the how long that uh, radiation uh, stay or could you I know you explained it, but could you say it again? Yeah. Yes, so you have to think about it this way. Um, once you have, let, let's really talk about the case of Hiroshima where you're exploding at a certain altitude. So first thing that happens is you get um, uh, neutrons and gamma rays that come out, right? That, that, are, that come out and hit the ground. At the ground, probably not many people will die from this initial dose of radiation. This is the initial radiation that you have. They will not die because they'll die from other reasons, which is the blast wave. Okay, so now you imagine that this fireball is rising very, very fast upward, as I said, something like 200 miles per hour. In it is all the debris and all kinds of radioactive materials that are there. As it goes up higher, it's going to feel winds coming from different directions. And the winds will vary as a function of altitude. Once it gets to be a very high altitude, Right? If it's a very large explosion, then that fireball goes very high. Then that will go in the stratosphere and for, you know, it'll take months for it to settle down. Now, the important thing here is time. 
because the material itself becomes less radioactive with time. So if it goes up to not very high altitude and then rain, rain causes it to come down to the ground, then those people in the ground are going to be exposed to that, right? If that would take a very long time, then actually it's going to be less radioactive. So if the explosion happened close to the ground or that radioactive fallout came, came to the ground, then the effect, and it's happened very quickly soon after the explosion happened, then the effect is going to be much more dramatic on, on people. Now, in case of Hiroshima, what I understand is that what happened is since it was exploded at 500 meters high or something like this, it quick, the, the, um, the fireball quickly went up and whatever radioactive materials settled, not necessarily in the air, you know, near to where the city is, but a little bit further away. So not everybody in the city itself were affected due to radiation, but they will have been affected due to the blast and the firestorm and, and all that stuff. But people in other places might have been affected by uh, the radiation itself. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so I also wanted to ask you the effect of nuclear uh, weapons testing. Um, so now North Korea is the only country that is conducting nuclear weapons testing, but uh, before uh, many, you know, US, the France were conducting uh, atmospheric nuclear weapons testing. Uh, could you share your thoughts on the impact of the nuclear weapons testing for the people or environment? Yes, I mean, that really depends on what test we're talking about. There have been something, I think, over 500 atmospheric tests. So these are tests that are not conducted underground, where you're kind of um, uh, preventing the radiation and other effects from actually uh, hitting people <laughs> on, on the surface. But here the tests are conducted actually on the surface or as I said, as an air, air burst somewhat, somewhat away from the, at a higher altitude. In that case, the effect, and there were about, about 500 of them or more than 500 of them, um, the effect is very different from an underground blast, which is what North Korea has conducted now. So in that case, you have the effect that I discussed where you have the fallout which could travel for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers and could settle somewhere else. You can also have what are called hot spots where the um, radioactive particles that contain this, you know, the, that would, would emit the radiation could kind of clump off in certain areas. And then if you had a thunderstorm somewhere would rain out in different locations. Now, if the test, the test site itself is very large, then they may be lucky and none of it will go outside the test site. But there have been cases where these radioactive uh, particulates and these materials have actually gone outside um, of the test site and have hurt, uh, hurt, hurt a lot of people who are downwind from, uh, from where the tests were conducted. And also, it's kind of amazing, um, but the, uh, even thousands of kilometers away, um, you could have this radioactive material landing in somewhere in some, some hotspot. This happened in, I think, somewhere in uh, uh, New York State, where the test was in Nevada test site, but actually the radioactivity landed somewhere in uh, New York State. So there have been um, cases like that um, that have happened. Now, there's people who've done a calculation on uh, the effect of, um, of atmospheric testing and really underground testing on, uh, on the entire planet, on the population of the planet. And the numbers are staggering. It's many, many thousands of people who have died because of the radiation. Now, these are estimates that are done, which are not that they actually counted the people who passed away. These are estimates that are done by extrapolating how many deaths um, uh, there could be to that because it's very, very difficult to know whether somebody who dies or somebody who gets cancer 
is dying because of um, uh, due to radioactivity or some other cause. Now, there are areas in, uh, for example, in Semipalatinsk uh, nuclear test site and, and other areas where there have been, you know, deformations, people die, and people are born with birth defects and so on, where the effect is, where you can see increase in, in, in effect. But the much harder problem is determining what is the effect basically globally due to this increase of radioactivity that's been uh, put into the atmosphere. And that's a much harder thing to, to measure. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Ferenc. So there are so many things to learn. So after you watched this video, and if you still have a question, just uh, let us know. And uh, I'm sure that I have to ask Dr. <laughs> Ferenc Darnik Beres. But uh, uh, he mentioned a very important thing. Um, Although we are studying this from the scientific perspective, it is always uh, very important to to understand what how people how people suffered under the mushroom crowd. And uh, yesterday at yesterday's Nobel Peace Prize, in addition to the atomic bombing survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, people from Kazakhstan, yeah, semi Palatinsk, and also. Uh, Marshall Island, I think they were also invited to the uh, Nobel Peace uh, Prize ceremony. So I think it's always important to understand the such a human impact when we study the nuclear uh, weapons issues. So again, thank you very much, friends, and uh, I really appreciate uh, your uh, lecture. So, and also thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you. Bye-bye.